Good afternoon. My name is Ron Klein, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's webinar hosted by the Jewish Democratic Council of America. Uh, I'm the chair of JDCA, and in the nearly three years since our founding, our organization has established itself as the national voice of Jewish Democrats advocating for Jewish and democratic values. Three months ago, JDCA launched Democrats Leading in Crisis call series, amplifying the voices of those leading amid the crisis. Each week, we have brought together members of Congress, experts, and thousands of you to discuss important issues ranging from racial justice, voting access, and the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we're gonna to hear from Democrats leading in foreign policy. Specifically, we'll hear from three supporters of the U.S.-Israel relationship about what unilateral Israeli annexation of portions of the West Bank would mean for Israel and the U.S.-Israel relationship. Very privileged to have with us today Ambassador Dan Shapiro, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, and Congressman Brad Schneider. The overwhelming majority of Jewish voters are both pro-Israel and supportive of a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict which remains the best viable option for ensuring Israel's future as a Jewish democratic state. Many Jewish Americans are also deeply concerned that unilateral Israeli annexation of parts of the West Bank may permanently preclude a two-state solution and weaken Israel's security. That is why JDCA has warned against annexation. We're fortunate to have with us three speakers who will speak to this issue today who have been deeply involved in the issue. First, we're gonna hear from the two members of Congress who led the recent letter signed by nearly 200 House Democrats expressing concern about unilateral annexation, Representatives Brad Schneider and Representative Jan Schakowsky. We will then hear from former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, Dan Shapiro. Our speakers will be taking your questions after their remarks, so please send them to info at jewishdems.org. That's info at jewishdems.org. You can also post your questions in the chat area of Zoom. Finally, we invite you to join the conversation on Twitter by tweeting us at, at US Jewish Dems. That's at US Gem Jewish Dems and using the hashtag Jewish Dems in action. I'm now going to turn it over to JDCA board member, Mike Tarnoff to introduce Congressman Schneider. Mike? Thank you, Ron. I've known Brad Schneider for a very long time through our mutual involvement in Jewish philanthropy. Since 2017, Brad has been my congressman representing the 10th Congressional District of Illinois. He has been an outspoken advocate for the people of Illinois and a defender of our values, including supporting access to affordable health care and ensuring economic opportunity for all Americans. Brad serves as an influential voice on the foreign affairs in Congress and believes we benefit when the United States exercises leadership and engages with the international community. A longtime proponent of a strong U.S.-Israel relationship, Brad consistently leads in, on efforts in Congress to promote cooperation on security, counter Iran's influence, and condemn efforts to delegitimize the Jewish state. I'm now gonna turn it over to JDCA's senior policy advisor, Steve Sheffy, to, to introduce Congresswoman Schakowsky. Thank you, Mike. Since her election in 1998, my good friend, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, has represented the 9th Congressional District of Illinois. She is a member of the House Democratic Leadership Team and co-founder and co-chair of the House Task Force on Aging and Families. Congresswoman Schakowsky shares our values as evidenced by her leadership on critically important issues in Congress that include expanding access to health care and defending a principled and strong U.S. foreign policy. Congresswoman Schakowsky has consistently voted for measures to support Israel's peace and security. She strongly supports helping Israel reach a negotiated two-state solution with the Palestinians and is a leader on this issue in Congress. I live in Brad's district, but I consider Jan my representative too, and I am proud to call both of them my friends. Over to my friends, starting first with Brad, followed by Jan, and then they'll both take your questions. 
Uh, Steve, thank you. Steve, Michael, thank you so much uh, for, for the nice introduction, the kind words, uh, but more for your friendship of, of many years. Uh, I think, Michael, see, we both go back more, more than 30 years. Uh, we've been doing this a long time. Uh, to Ron, to, to Haley, uh, it's, it's good to be a part of uh, your program and, and the work that you guys are doing is critical for our future. And obviously, and, and Didi, I don't want to forget Didi, and, and obviously uh, to be on a panel with Ambassador Shapiro and, and Congresswoman Schakowsky is a, a great honor. Uh, we do come here today at a, a, a critical moment. Uh, uh, June 30th, tomorrow, July 1st, was the date set in the um, uh, unity agreement uh, between uh, was then blue and white and uh, Likud or Bibi Netanyahu and, and Benny Gans to, to form a unity government. And the, the permitted date that uh, Bibi Netanyahu, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu could, could go forward with an annexation move. It, it appears that that at, at the moment has been delayed, but it, it doesn't, I think, relieve us of the concern. And so that's why I think it was so important for, as was mentioned, uh, 191 members of the Democratic caucus, more than 80% of our caucus, uh, speaking in a common voice uh, on a letter that I had the privilege to lead with uh, uh, my colleague, Jan Schakowsky, Ted Deutsch, David Price. And the letter was very clear. Uh, there are great risks in the idea of any unilateral, any unilateral action. And by, by taking a unilateral move at, at this moment, uh, that what we highlighted in the letter, concerns of the, the significant progress made uh, with the Arab states uh, and, and Israel on, on trying to find a path of, of cooperation ultimately towards peace. The threat to the peace agreement with Jordan, uh, highlighted by statements as well as uh, public uh, uh, documents of, uh, of King Abdullah of Jordan. And, and thirdly, the, the relationship with Israel's allies and partners in Europe. All of this was, was in the public sphere, uh, threats being made or, or, or concerns being raised. And I think it was important for the Democrats in Congress to make our voice heard as well. Uh, and what we said in the letter, we don't see how the risk against the potential uh, benefits, uh, any potential benefits of unilateral action are outweighed. And we called on the, on the Israeli government to uh, reconsider its position. I don't know how significant our letter was in, in the uh, current uh, status of, of, of that move, uh, but what I do hope is that our letter highlights the importance of the U.S.-Israel Israel relationship. For, um, for many, many years, uh, going back to the, the initial founding of Israel when President Harry Truman was the first to recognize Israel, to over the last uh, several decades where Israel has enjoyed just a distinctive unprecedented bipartisan support in the United States Congress for a strong U.S.-Israel relationship. Israel security and the United States security have been intrinsically linked. Uh, there, it is a bond that is unlike any relationship we have with any other nation. Israel is our most important ally in the region, one of our most important allies in the world, and we need to do everything we can to ensure that. Israel security is America's security, and I think the, the signers of that letter all understand that. But Israel taking unilateral steps or the Palestinians taking unilateral steps doesn't move us towards peace. In the end, what we're hoping to achieve, I think what every Israeli is aspiring to, is a secure Israel, a Jewish democratic Israel that uh, can live in, in peace and prosperity uh, with its Palestinian neighbors. And uh, I believe very strongly that the path to that is a two-state solution, uh, the Jewish democratic state of Israel and a, a future Palestinian state that recognizes Israel, Israel's unique status and uh, wants to pursue a, a bright future together. And with that, let me uh, turn it back and I'll turn it over to Jan. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm happy to be with, uh, with all of you. Um, and thanks, Ron, for the, uh, for the invitation. Um, so, I uh, was so proud to be able to lead this letter along with Brad, along with Ted Deutsch, and along with David Price. These um, two of us are, are known to, are more known to be, um, I would say, critical of the, um, of Bibi's administration. Um, but the four of us, I think really equally um, believe that the only answer for um, the security of Israel, for Israel to be a Jewish and a democratic state, 
um, for um, greater hopes of peace in the region, the um, agreements with both Egypt and Jordan, um, and the allies closest, um, some of the closest friends of the, uh, of the state of Israel around, around the world, that all of this would be, would be jeopardized. Um, and so this letter, and I'm uh, assuming that all or certainly most of you have, have read that letter um, that had the vast majority of the um, Congress. I, I, I think you ought to be cognizant of, of the fact that there is another letter um, on the Democratic side, not, and I'll say something about the, um, as well, on the um, Republican. They sent a letter basically saying that as a democracy um, and an ally that Israel can do anything and that the um, Palestinians will never come to an agreement. Um, you know, we, I'm sure you have that letter as well. But there is a, a, a letter that I think has um, fewer people that have signed it that talks about conditioning um, money to, um, to, to Israel. Um, and I wanna tell you that I, I made it clear um, to um, Aviv Ezra, the council general in Chicago, that inevitably this issue is going to come up if there is an unilateral annexation of the of the West Bank, it will come up in the in the Congress. The only way I see to um, av avoid that in a really damaging way um, is that we, um, you know, that that this annexation be dropped. Now, I'm very happy. Um, that in fact it has been um, postponed, that the government has decided not to press forward immediately on the July um, 1st um, kickoff. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's tomorrow. And, and hope, you know, and the thing that I think is so politically ham handed about this, one could argue they want to do it now as long as Trump is in the is in the in the White House. But I look at it a different way. I think it is very likely um, Jewish Democrats that um, there is going to be a dramatic change. Um, I think including um, it's very possible the Senate as well as the White House. Um, we've seen um, Joe Biden come out and while certainly not talking about cutting money, but um, not very clear that annexation was a bad idea. And it seems to me if the US Israel relationship, which we always call unbreakable, is to stay that way, that it would be wise politically to um, not immediately kick um, most American Jews and um, right now the majority of the House and I think um, a major transformation coming very soon in terms of the uh, of the election. Um, so I, I just think that it is a it, it's, it's such a seriously bad move um, to do this uni unilateral um, annexation um, that um, I'm really happy that we were able to get the broad range of the Democratic Caucus to sign on to, to, this, uh, to this letter. Um, and I think that it has had its, its impact. For many, this is the first time um, for many members to actually send a letter and, and make their feeling known to a foreign government. Um, you know, often those letters go to the administration, to um, a secretary, but not to um, an outside government. But, you know, we, um, everyone who signed made the decision that that was a good idea in this case um, to express our view as strong supporters of the state of Israel. And I want to underscore that. Um, these are all supporters of the state of Israel that, uh, that signed the, the letter. So it ha seems to have had um, uh, an impact uh, at, this, at this point. 
And uh, I just want to appreciate um, and the support that we have gotten from the, uh, from the Jewish community to weigh in on this as well. Um, so it's not just a, um, uh, uh, you know, members of, of Congress, it's not just the House of Representatives, but it's um, ordinary people um, and, uh, that are weighing in. So I'm gonna end there. Thank you so much, Congressman Snyder and Congresswoman Schakowsky. Um, we are actually going to add Ambassador Shapiro to this discussion and then direct the questions to all three of you. So I will now turn it to our board member in Maryland, Dee Dee Feinberg, to introduce Ambassador Shapiro and keep sending your questions to info at jewishdems.org or posting them in the chat and you can direct your questions to any of our three speakers. Over to you, Dee Dee. Thank you, Haley. For a remarkable six years, from 2011 to 2017, Dan Shapiro served as our ambassador to Israel. In this role, he helped to shape American policy related to Israel, including our strong and unwavering security and military relationship. In this role, the ambassador helped to negotiate and finalize the unprecedented $38 billion 10-year Memorandum of Understanding between the United States and Israel, signed by President Obama in 2016. Before serving as an ambassador, he worked in the White House as Senior Director for the Middle East and North Africa on the National Security Council staff. He also worked for the House Foreign Affairs Committee, as well as Senators Feinstein and Nelson. Prior to that, he served as National Security Council staff in the Clinton White House. In all these roles, Ambassador Shapiro has contributed to U.S. efforts to support negotiations between Israel and Palestinians, to increase U.S. security assistance to Israel, and to strengthen sanctions and other measures against Syria, Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas. We are grateful for the Ambassador's consistent and principled leadership and for his friendship with JDCA. Ambassador. Uh, thank you, D yeah, thank you, Dee Dee. Uh, thank you, uh, Ron and Haley. It's great to be with JDCA. Uh, I've only ever played uh, uh, slot machines once. More than you need to know is in the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas, but I know that three of a kind is the jackpot and you have three proud uh, natives of Illinois. I don't know if you're both natives, but three uh, Illinoisans uh, with Congressman Schneider, uh, Congresswoman Schakowsky and me from Champaign, Illinois, and uh, we're representing uh, the great state of Illinois uh, together uh, very proudly. Um, I would uh, want us to start by expressing my uh, strong appreciation for uh, the leadership that uh, Congressman Schneider, Congresswoman Schakowsky, Congressman Deutsch, and Congressman Price showed in uh, bringing the Democratic caucus together, uh, nearly the entire caucus, 191 members, and even some of the ones who didn't sign, we know are in agreement with it, uh, to express something really quite fundamental, uh, that uh, the United States has this deep moral and strategic interest in ensuring uh, Israel's security. Uh, it's our closest democratic ally in the Middle East, only democratic ally in the Middle East, one of our closest in the world. It's never known a day uh, without its security and legitimacy being challenged. And uh, its ability to defend itself uh, is uh, something that the United States has been uh, critical uh, to ensuring. And that's uh, obviously in part due to the leadership of the members of Congress uh, on this screen and others. Um, and it's not a one-way relationship. We benefit a lot from that. So there's a US interest involved, both a moral and a strategic interest in ensuring that Israel has that security. And what is so concerning and what was expressed so, uh, uh, I think, effectively uh, by that letter uh, was that uh, these members and, uh, and so many in our uh, community and our party uh, believe that a unilateral annexation that's being proposed is going to really harm that interest, harm that American interest in Israel's security. Um, it will take, uh, in, in two fundamental ways. One, it will take a relatively stable situation uh, not a perfect situation, but a relatively stable situation in which Israel and Palestinian security forces cooperate uh, to prevent acts of terrorism. Uh, and it's going to introduce tensions into that relationship. It may not produce an immediate breakdown, and nobody should be hoping for it or certainly applauding uh, any acts of violence uh, that could follow it. But 
I think the reality we understand is that the Palestinian Authority, uh, which governs uh, the lives of, the, of most Palestinians in the West Bank, and whose security forces work very effectively uh, with uh, the Israeli security forces to prevent acts of terrorism, uh, would have a very hard time explaining uh, to its own people and justifying its own existence and uh, its own legitimacy if it didn't appear to be on the way toward the establishment of some kind of uh, Palestinian state. And while it may not uh, immediately disappear, and obviously one hopes it wouldn't, that there's a very good chance that over time that leadership, especially as it goes through a transition, President Abbas of the authority is uh, 85 or 86, so it will be going through a transition. Um, uh, it, that authority will simply fade away. And so what may start as a you know, partial annexation of the West Bank, uh, which is complicating enough, uh, probably more than complicating the Trump plan with the map it describes uh, of a 30% annexation of the West Bank leaves nothing that could possibly be considered a viable Palestinian state uh, in the remaining territory. Uh, but what would likely happen is that authority would sort of melt away. Uh, the security forces would not be able to continue their uh, cooperation. Israel would find itself pulled back into uh, all the Palestinian population centers of the Middle East, of the West Bank, places it hasn't been for 25 years, places no Israeli wants the Israeli army to be, and then find itself really in full control of that two and a half to three million Palestinian population. Um, and uh, that is going to draw resources from other threats, uh, the ones in the north from Hezbollah and Syria, the ones in the east from Iran, the ones from the south from Hamas. That's where the vast majority of US assistance is called upon uh, to help protect against Israeli threats. Uh, but it's also going to call into the question fundamentally that uh, uh, those uh, two aspects of Israeli uh, Israel's identity that are so uh, fundamental to its own uh, uh, purpose and to the common values that we share, and that it's its democratic and, and Jewish identity. It will be very difficult to sustain both of those while it uh, is, finds itself in full control of the West Bank. And there's an inexorable quality, what may start as a partial uh, annexation, again, probably uh, even those partial annexations as they're described in the Trump plan, uh, are more than enough to make a Palestinian state an, an impossibility. Uh, once it expands inexorably, uh, it really uh, puts the Jewish and democratic character in uh, fundamental uh, question. And that will introduce tensions, as I think uh, Congresswoman Schakowsky was sort of alluding to, into the security partnership that we benefit so much from. Um, it, uh, uh, it's going to weaken the bipartisan consensus uh, about Israel. Vice President Biden has spoken to this, and he's actually made an interesting point. There's some very compelling polling that backs up his point that uh, it would actually undercut support for Israel among younger voters of both parties. Uh, it's not actually uh, 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 that it would make it a partisan split. It would actually undermine broad uh, American support for the kind of partnership that we all believe in, that we all have helped build, and that we all uh, feel the United States interests strongly benefit from. And I would just add one last point on this, which is that the negative reaction, of course, I think would be exacerbated to see a decision to push through a unilateral uh, uh, annexation just in these final months, maybe even weeks uh, before uh, a U.S. election. Uh, it's, it, it does appear that uh, things have been postponed beyond July 1st. That's only going to shorten the time uh, till the election. Uh, and in a situation in which, in our two-party system, uh, there is an absolute consensus uh, in one of our parties, that's our party, uh, including among Israel's absolute strongest supporters in the party, people like Brad Schneider and Jan Szyszkowski and Ted Deutsch and Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer and Joe Biden, people who have really put themselves and on the line for Israel security time after time after time. Um, and when that party is saying, in the spirit of friendship and the spirit of belief in our common interests, uh, in a very uh, loud and clear and consensual way, we think this is a harmful thing to do. It would certainly be a harmful time to do it. Final point, you know, I, I come to uh, these questions having been informed by many, many hundreds of hours of time spent with uh, Israeli leaders, including Prime Minister Netanyahu. And, you know, he himself. Uh, is the person uh, who held us very uh, strongly to a standard which I, I very much agree with, which is that, that uh, there shouldn't be unilateral measures. Uh, agreements should only, uh, outcomes in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict can only really be reached uh, and, uh, and will only be widely accepted if they are the result of direct negotiations 
between the two parties, not unilateral measures, one side imposing them on the other. Uh, this was a principle we held by and uh, we, I still strongly believe. He also told me many times that he actually was against annexation. In fact, he never endorsed annexation until uh, just a week before the election in April 2019 because he saw the risk that I described a moment ago of Israel becoming a binational state with uh, an inability to retain both its Jewish and democratic character, and that there were many creative ways to solve the security challenges uh, and give Palestinians uh, uh, who, once they're ready to come to the table, and they certainly bear plenty of responsibility for the stalemate we find ourselves in, but uh, to enable uh, at least keeping alive the notion of a, uh, a Palestinian state that has a modicum of uh, sovereignty and uh, can defend that to its own people and lives in peace and security and mutual recognition with Israel. That's what we've worked for for 25 years. That's what we should try to keep alive, even in a period that's very difficult. That's what Vice President Biden uh, has committed that if he's president, uh, he will work toward. And uh, the letter that was sent by uh, the two members here and their colleagues uh, last week uh, was definitely heard loud and clear uh, as a, a, a letter from friends concerned about this partnership, concerned about Israel's security, concerned about the future of our relationship and the damage uh, that unilateral annexation would do to all of those things. Great, well, thank you. Thanks to all three of you. Uh, you've left us with uh, quite a bit uh, to ask about. And our first question will go to one of JDCA's summer this campus is, fellows. Can you hear me? This is Jan yes. I, yes, As I it can. turns out, I am gonna have to go to the, the floor, but if I could oh, just- okay. um, sure. I, if I could just underscore, I did not know that um, polling indicates that both Republicans and Democrats would not be happy. It would adversely affect um, the president. I think that's really important, Ambassador. But the other thing I wanted to make clear is that Nancy um, Pelosi, while she, her signature is not there, she was very, very supportive of this letter. I talked to her several times uh, about it. She was very grateful that it was happening. She conducts her own level of foreign policy um, at a, you know, a different level, but um, she really was um, with us all the way. I, I, so I just wanted to say that, but I need to get to the floor to speak. So thank you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. We Thanks appreciate you being with us today. Our first question, is from Blake Flayton, who is a JDCA campus fellow from Arizona. Over to Hi everyone, thank you for taking questions. Um, we know that while over 90% of American Jews identify as pro-Israel, the majority of American Jews are critical of at least some of Israeli government policy. This creates a balancing act for anybody who is pro-Israel but is also quite critical of the Israeli government's right-wing policies. We want to support the Jewish homeland and want to continue our connection with Israel, but moves like unilateral annexation and continued settlement building are difficult to defend. How do we educate those around us that there is a difference between being a proud Zionist and proudly pro-Israel and also being critical of Israel's right-wing policies? Congressman. Uh, Blake, great, great question. Um, it's actually not a new question. I, I know when uh, I was a student a relatively long time ago, uh, we had the same issues um, uh, and challenges. It's something that we, we've always dealt with. And, and that the conversation then I think it's a fair point to make to, uh, now is that, um, you know, start with at home. I am a, a proud American. I, I love my country. Uh, I, I have two sons. I have a son who serves in the, in the United States Navy, but I don't agree with every policy of my country. I don't agree with every policy of every government. I can be critical of that. That's what makes this country so strong. And uh, being critical isn't, doesn't mean condemning or uh, disavowing the, the country I love. The same is the case as, as a um, Zionist and an ardent Zionist. I, I believe Zionism is the idea that the Jewish people can control their own destiny that uh, they have a, a right to a homeland and an opportunity uh, to achieve, achieve their dreams. Uh, that doesn't mean that there are not two legitimate claims to the same land. That has been the case for more, more than a century. And that's why direct negotiations are so important. I don't agree with everything any Israeli government has done, whether it was a, a, a labor government, a coup government, 
Kadim or, or unity government. Um, and a, as, a, as a proud Zionist and a friend of Israel, uh, first as a student, then as an um, advocate, and now as a, a member of Congress, I won't hesitate to, to share my feelings. I think there are constructive ways to do it. Again, in, in the case of this point, the letter and having 80%, more than 80% of the Democrats say this, it was not a letter that condemned Israel. It was a letter that raised our concerns and shared a, a, a vision for Israel with uh, peace and prosperity um, and security. Uh, and, and that's how we do it. But it's, you know, there are people on the other side, and I'll finish with this thought. Um, our, our students on campus face a professional cadre of anti-Israel um, folks that have a different view, uh, aren't willing to recognize the legitimacy of, of Israel, aren't willing to recognize uh, the Zionist aspiration, deny the Jewish people's uh, right to, to want a state of their own. Uh, that is anti-Semitism by that de definition. It's something that we've been fighting for generations. and uh, Your kids will fight it every bit as much as uh, my kids are now fighting. I can just add a thought, which is that uh, just last week, shortly after the letter was sent, uh, there was a very moving column written, I think it was in the Times of Israel, by Yossi Klein Halevi, uh, the Israeli writer and journalist, uh, really highlighting uh, Brad Schneider and Ted Deutsch in particular, but I think it applies to many of the other signers of that letter, uh, as people who have really demonstrated throughout their careers, throughout their lives, uh, that they are deeply committed to Israel as Zionists, that they are deeply committed as Jews, they're deeply committed as Americans, that that friendship uh, is not only manifest in uh, voting for security assistance, which of course they always do, uh, and standing up against BDS and, and unfair uh, delegitimization of Israel, uh, which they also always do, but also uh, getting to know Israelis, getting to know the diversity and the beauty and the, and the challenges of Israeli society, uh, really spending time there, really appreciating that it's not just about one issue, uh, that there is an entire spectrum of, uh, of a society and an economy and challenges and, and beauty and obviously also all the all the things all of society struggle with. They know that about Israel. And so when those types of friends come and say in the spirit of friendship, uh, this is something that raises our concern for your well-being, for our own interests that are connected to your well-being, um, it really should be heard uh, in, in in with appreciation. And 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 Yossi Klein Levy, who you know has been critical of people who have raised criticisms of Israel and maybe puts themselves somewhere in the center, center right or center left, it might vary on the issue. Uh, I think captured very beautifully uh, the spirit that uh, Brad was just describing uh, uh, for him and Ted, but for, for others on that letter as well. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Blake. Our next question comes from Mark Hetfield. Opposing annexation is easy before it happens. What would each speaker recommend a Biden administration do if there is an annexation recognized by the Trump administration? The Trump administration walked back the Iran deal. Should a Democratic administration also walk this back? Should there be sanctions? So that was a few questions and we'll start with you, Ambassador Shapiro. Sure. Well, that's the, obviously one of the big questions that people are struggling with is the what if question. So the first answer, of course, is the best outcome uh, is to uh, dissuade uh, in, with the, in the spirit of friendship that this not be something that uh, a new administration would be faced with. Uh, it's derivative of, I think, a very trouble, troubling plan put forward by the Trump administration uh, at the end of January. It's not, although it uses the um, uh, the language of a two-state solution, and that was new. President Trump previously had not endorsed it, and maybe that's the one silver lining we could uh, extract and, and use to build a, a, a better policy in the future is that Trump finally did endorse a two-state solution. But the actual plan really doesn't represent anything that could be uh, considered a, a meaningful two-state solution. And mostly what it would do is it, it would uh, facilitate this unilateral annexation. So it's derivative of that. Uh, uh, especially in these closing um, weeks and months of, of the election, the best outcome would be to, to dissuade and put this question off. It shouldn't happen before the election, and then maybe we don't face the question that Mark just asked. But obviously, uh, we have to think through the, the options, and I, none of us speak for the Biden campaign. Uh, that will be for them to speak. What the vice president has said publicly is 
that he opposes uh, unilateral annexation along with unilateral acts by both parties. And he is very critical of things that Palestinians have done unilaterally as well. Um, and that he would oppose it as president. Uh, but the reason I think there isn't more specificity on that, there's certainly a range of options uh, of what could be done to try to balance it, to try to more importantly than balance it, try to steer the policy back on the path toward keeping a meaningful uh, two-state solution alive, if not to immediately begin negotiations so that it would be available when different leaders emerge for the negotiations. The reason there isn't more specificity about that is because the details matter. Uh, none of us know if this is going to happen, when it will happen, what the extent of it will be already. It's a slight, slid of date. There's multiple versions of what is being uh, uh, considered uh, for annexation appearing in the Israeli press almost every day. It sounds like the IDF, which would of course have to implement it and defend the new borders it would define is uh, planning against three, four, five, six different scenarios. Uh, some versions uh, might produce a, an outcome that is closer to what previous negotiations have envisioned in terms of Israel retaining certain territories that uh, uh, it, it might have kept through negotiations, not by unilaterally, and in, in the course of land swaps. So there are a lot of different uh, tools that one might apply uh, depending on the de details, but all of that's hypothetical. We don't know them. Uh, so it's probably premature for, for anybody to judge or, or specify. I think the, the important point is that the vice president has said is that he would reverse a number of other uh, policies that President Trump has made that have been harmful to uh, uh, prospects for two states, including cutting off assistance to Palestinians that is permitted uh, under the Taylor Force Act, includes for security cooperation, includes for economic and humanitarian assistance. Uh, that is, uh, he would restore uh, diplomatic contacts with Palestinians that have been cut off by the Trump administration. And he would put, restore the frame that the United States is trying to help these uh, two peoples, as, 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 uh, as Congressman Schneider said, both with, with uh, legitimate claims to this land uh, to get back to the negotiating table, not necessarily immediately, but at least to keep alive a viable two-state solution. So there's a whole range of options uh, for what, uh, what steps you would take. Some of them in response, if we're faced with it, uh, uh, to a unilateral annexation. Some of them, uh, even if that has not occurred. So that's the framework, and then the details would only be able to be decided once that administration confronted the specific situation. Yeah, and, and the, the one thing I'll, I'll add to that or, or reiterate that is I think what uh, uh, you know, Vice President Biden can do, has done, and as he moves, uh, you know, God willing, winning the election in November and then the transition for the, the uh, three months until he takes office in January, is just emphasize the commitment to two states. And that uh, the United States is is dedicated to that, and uh, uh, nothing the United States is is going to do is going to move that um, further away. What we're going to try to do is is move it to a closer possibility. Great. Um, our next two questions I'm going to group together, one for you, Congressman, and one for you, Ambassador Shapiro. Um, so for you, Congressman Schneider, um, there's a question from Jacob Kornblum from Jewish Insider. Does okay. it concern you that as many as 12 House members have signed a letter threatening to introduce legislation to condition aid to Israel, and that this may undermine the unified voice among Democrats that you led in your letter where you did not mention the issue of of aid. And then on a related note uh, for Ambassador Shapiro, from Steve from Illinois, as we know, there is a letter being circulated by uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and other members of Congress that talks about potentially withholding funds for the offshore procurement of Israeli weapons if Israel proceeds with unilateral annexation. How much, does, how much aid does the US currently provide to Israel for offshore procurement? And isn't this aid being phased out pursuant to the MOU that you helped to negotiate? So we'll start with the Congressman. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm not familiar with, with the specific legislation, but I'm gonna focus on the number you mentioned is of, of 12. Uh, that is a small minority of the 233 members of the, of the Democratic Caucus of the 435 members of, of Congress as a whole. Um, I'll point back to a resolution that the House passed last July, a resolution I had a privilege to, uh, to help lead 
Uh, we had 398 members of the House vote for that and 17 vote against it. Of the 12 members that were absent that day, 11 of them were co-sponsors. The really number was closer to 409. I think that's a reflection of the broad support we, we have for the U.S. Israel relationship in the United States Congress. I don't see that diminishing. Uh, it, it gets tested at times and, and a unilateral move would certainly uh, be a test. But uh, my hope is that A, we avoid it or B, if, if Israel does go down that path, um, we will we'll be able to address it at that time. The, the legislation, people introduce thousands of bills over the course of the year. Um, some go to an extreme on one side or another. That doesn't mean they come to the floor. So I, I remain confident in the, in the broad uh, support within the Democratic Caucus. Uh, both I and Jan talked about that. Uh, Representative Chikowski talked about that earlier. It doesn't happen um, by itself, though. And, and the last thing I'll say on this, it happens because uh, members of Congress, many of whom have no foreign policy experience before they run for office, some of whom have, have never spent any time uh, paying attention to what happens in the Middle East in general or, or within the Israel-Palestinian conflict in particular, they come to understand it when they get here. And the, the relationships we build, um, talking to them, uh, that's why uh, the, the four of us, uh, David Price, Jan Schakowsky, Ted Deutsch, and, and I, were able to, to build such broad support is because we, have, we didn't start last uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago with this letter. We've been working on, on the issue for a long time. We'll continue to work on it, and, and that's why the work that JDCA does is, is so important as, as well. Uh, so do I take it for granted? No. Am I worried? No. But do I know that I'm going to continue to uh, have to work on this issue for a long time to come, as will Blake and, and his generation? Absolutely. Um, so uh, just to piggyback one sentence on, on that answer, I mean, I've been asked uh, a similar question by a lot of people in relating to presidential primaries and uh, that small group who didn't vote for the resolution last summer. And uh, I would say, of course, there are you know some voices uh, in our party who, who are uh, uh, sounding maybe some different notes uh, than what we would sound. Uh, but um, they're at least among office holders, it's quite uh, quite limited. And our party is now led by a presidential nominee uh, who won his par uh, party primary very handily. Uh, that we, who really wears his love of Israel on his sleeve, who has said he uh, believes the. Uh, the, 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 the assistance we provide Israel is some of the best money we spend. If we didn't have an Israel in the Middle East, we'd have to uh, invent it. Uh, he called uh, proposals to condition aid to Israel outrageous and a gigantic mistake. So, you know, that's the, uh, uh, I think, the, still the very strong, uh, broad uh, position of, of most of our party. And, and uh, uh, you know, Congressman Schneider is among the leaders in ensuring that it remains the case in the Democratic caucus. Um, as to the question of offshore procurement, uh, it's a little bit technical. Uh, so if somebody's really done some uh, homework on this question um, of uh, the, the th what used to be about three mil three billion, and in the MOU was increased to three point three billion dollars of foreign military financing that is provided to Israel annually. Uh, so it's three point three billion out of the three point eight five hundred million is for missile defense. That's a different pot of money. Uh, Israel has been permitted over the last 20 years or so to spend about a quarter of it. It's about 26% uh, on what's called offshore procurement, which means they can convert the money into shekels and they can uh, buy uh, products made in Israel by Israeli contractors that are spare parts and, and the like that support uh, the, rest of their, uh, the rest of the military assistance. Um, when the MOU was being negotiated, um, uh, we looked at the history of that, and uh, one of the reasons that offshore procurement was put in place back in, I think, the 1980s was that Israel then had a very nascent uh, defense industry, and it was important to help them build up their own capabilities uh, so that they had that as a backstop to what we were providing and could really uh, build a, an industry that could help uh, ensure their own security. Well, the Israeli defense industry has grown by leaps and bounds since then. It's one of the most mature, competitive uh, exporting defense uh, industries in the world. And there are places where it actually competes with, with US defense contractors. And uh, our feeling was that it, uh, that purpose uh, was, had sort of uh, passed its, uh, its, its, its need. Um, and in addition, it deprives Israel in a way of using all of the funds that American taxpayers provide to purchase the uh, unique capabilities that only the United States can 
uh, can can sell them F-35s, F-15s, F-16s, uh, and and the like. So uh, the 26 percent uh, was put on a 10-year glide path to phase that out over the course of the uh, over the course of the 10-year MOU. In the first five years, it's a very very shallow drop from about 850 million down to maybe 725 million over the first five years, and then a steeper drop down to zero over the over the second five years of the MOU, I think. So we're in year two of the MOU. Right now, uh, it would be about 800 million of the 3.3 that they can spend on their uh, in their own defense industry. That gives them plenty of time to make adjustments, to plan the phasing for companies to find alternative uh, sources of revenue and, and, and markets. Um, and they're making that adjustment. I talk to Israeli defense companies all the time who are preparing and because they have time to prepare for that. Uh, it seems like uh, I, I certainly wouldn't uh, support making any change uh, to that uh, provision, which uh, again was made in part because the original purpose of offshore procurement had outlived its its need, but also because it actually maximizes the benefit of the uh, security assistance package by ensuring that Israel gets the maximum of what are the unique capabilities the U.S. can provide. I I I don't expect there to be any change in how Congress addresses that in the in the appropriations bills. Thank you. Well, Steve, who came up with a very technical question, got a very technical answer, and uh, no one is better suited to answer that question than you. So thank you for that. I've now grouped together four questions. Uh, the first one is a yes or no uh, for you, Congressman. From Barry Balik, has there been an Israeli government response to your letter? Uh, th thanks for the question. Uh, there, there's been back channel conversations, but not, I'm not aware of a, a public response. And uh, I will put a plug for Steve Sheffy on his question and his newsletter. There'll be more details. Okay, so no response yet. Are you expecting a response? Uh, I'll look to see what actions, uh, I'm less concerned about the words and more concerned about what actions are taken uh, in the months and months ahead. I, I will just add that since I'm, I'm in Israel, I can tell you the letter has been read, it has been received, it has been uh, taken. I, think we, I am aware that the letter has been read and received, absolutely. Great. Okay. From Rabbi Stu Gerson, with you, I strongly oppose annexation. That said, I don't understand why the House letter, terrific in all other aspects, did not call upon the PA to return to negotiations and make Israel a serious offer. It was a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, Larry Margolis says, what do you believe will be the impact of the PA announcement of the willingness to return to direct negotiations with Israel? And on a related note, Russ Holstein from California asks, what are we to make of the PA's belated offer to negotiate? Is it simply a ploy to look good? How might it affect annexation? And how might it affect the Trump peace plan? So this issue of the role of the Palestinians and their offer to now negotiate. Yeah, uh, all great points. And, and, and to be perfectly clear, uh, Israel has not had a partner to negotiate for a, a long time. And the Palestinians have uh, reticent is a, a fancy word, but it doesn't begin to describe the Palestinians' uh, uh, refusal to come to the table. Um, we need, you can't have negotiations by yourself. Both parties need to sit down at the table and need to have serious, uh, good faith discussions about the, the steps that, that both sides have to take. And Palestinians have not been willing to do that. The, the fact that they, they might be willing to do that, you know, on, on the one hand, some people will make the argument with, with some validation that the, the pressure applied by um, the threats of annexation and, and other things brought the Palestinians to the table. Well, if, if it did, great. If it was other things, great. I just want to get the, the negotiations go, going forward. Uh, if I'll shift gears a little bit, if, if they do come to the table, if there are legitimate discussions that begin to take place, I think what's critical is that the United States return to its role as not as the independent arbiter, but as the unique power that can provide the safe forum for the two sides to have those conversations, uh, to be able to make the decisions that they each have to make to, to move towards the peace, that Israel knows that the United States will stand by its side and, and uh, will uh, stand by its, its security and, 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 and future. Uh, and the Palestinians understand that as well. Uh, but the Palestinians understand that the, 
the U.S. is committed to uh, two states, a viable state, demilitarized, demilitarized state for the Palestinians. Thank you, Ambassador. Sure. Um, I want to underscore uh, what Congressman Schneider said that, uh, you know, the Palestinians bear a lot of responsibility for uh, previous failed negotiations, for negotiations they didn't show up for, for the general stalemate that we found ourselves in for, for so long. And uh, nobody should uh, try to pretend otherwise. It doesn't mean everything was, was perfect in those negotiations for them. But uh, I think that's, uh, that's a very fair criticism. I also think they made a very big mistake to cut off their own communication with the Trump administration all the way back in December 2017, when the, uh, when the administration recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital and announced the move of the embassy. People can have different views on those decisions. I thought they were the right decisions, although not necessarily done uh, the right way. Um, but uh, certainly it was a mistake by the Palestinians to, to cut, cut off that contact. Now, if you want to be a mediator in a conflict, you have to be able to talk to both sides. And so the Trump administration also deserves criticism for not making much of an effort, in fact, generally compounding the split uh, uh, or the, the un inability to have those conversations and then ending up where they presented a plan that was only discussed with one side, which obviously isn't going to go very far. So uh, I think the Palestinians should long since have been at the table, even once the plan with all its flaws was presented. I think a smarter approach for them, for their interests and, and for the overall situation would have been for them to uh, agree to come and talk. They don't have to accept the Trump plan as the, uh, the basis for those talks, but I think they would have been better off to do that. I think even today, uh, they'd be better off to do that. So uh, while this is a belated uh, move, this recent uh, statement that they would be willing to come and talk, um, perhaps it should be tested. Um, and uh, it's not likely to lead to any kind of uh, breakthrough anytime soon. I think we should have our, uh, you know, our eye on, on reality as far as that goes. But uh, some kind of discussion is always better than none. Um, and certainly when uh, uh, Vice President Biden becomes President Biden, uh, he will uh, expect uh, both parties to be willing to uh, be open to those kinds of discussions. Uh, they might, again, be on a different basis. Perhaps his administration would have uh, new proposals. Perhaps he would seek proposals from the parties. Um, but uh, the, the, the stance that uh, we won't talk isn't going to get isn't going to get anywhere. Um, it, I, I also think, uh, though, as, as was just said, we also should be realistic. I would not expect even if uh, somehow talks were arranged now or early next year, uh, they'd be likely to lead anywhere, not with the current leaderships that have a long history of mistrust uh, that really have kind of written each other off. I think it will take probably some changes of leadership, uh, but the goal should be to keep the two-state solution uh, alive and viable as an achievable goal that future leaders who are willing uh, uh, to, to take some risks, to tell some hard truth to their people, which also Palestinian leaders have, have often failed to do, uh, to build some trust uh, with their opposite numbers and then to work with an American administration that is really able uh, and willing to accompany them on that journey as we have done successfully uh, in the cases of Egypt and Jordan, uh, that that's when we want to try again in a serious way. And so we need to keep, keep the two-state solution alive until. Great. Well, we have one final question here. We actually have far more than that. We've had over 270 people join today's call and we are grateful. But just briefly, we will we'll take one final question. This comes from Michael Rosenswag, who's a JDCA board member in Georgia. How should the U.S. react if, despite all efforts to dissuade Israel, Israel does move forward with unilateral annexation? Is there a meaningful and effective way to express disapproval without conditioning aid to Israel? And I would note that JDCA is both opposed to annexation, but also opposed to conditioning or cutting aid to Israel. We strongly support the MOU and don't want to see aid changed in any way. Ambassador? Um, well, I, again, I, I go back to something I said a, a moment ago, that the details matter, um, and it will be, uh, there, there, there are a lot of hypotheticals that, that one can only speculate about right now. Um, and if some form of unilateral annexation uh, in the next six months uh, and a uh, Biden administration comes in, uh, the goal is not to respond to or retaliate or punish or, or exact some sort of retribution. 
uh, for a, a step that uh, we all believe is a mistake, uh, but it is to try to steer things back on the path to uh, a two-state solution being kept alive, which unilateral annexation obviously does great damage to. So there may be measures that could be considered, uh, uh, which I don't really want to uh, detail or speculate on, that would address that specific uh, portion of the, the situation that that administration would encounter. Uh, but there are other steps that the vice president has, has spelled out that he would do, reversing uh, mistakes that uh, the President Trump has made, and additional measures that would uh, restore some, uh, some international uh, support and credibility to uh, efforts to uh, uh, get those parties uh, back on that path when many countries have, have sort of given up uh, and turned away from it. I mean, it's sometimes seen as a benefit to Israel uh, that many countries are paying less attention to this, so they may feel less pressure. On the other hand, that uh, also enables the slide toward this binational state that really puts Israel's Jewish and democratic character at, at grave risk. So uh, it, it has to be, it would have to be addressed, but I think we really aren't in a position to speculate on the specific steps. And I, I agree with the ambassador. Um, I think, uh, as he said earlier uh, in the conversation, until we know what it is, we, we don't know where we'll be. Um, but my hope is that uh, uh, saner minds will prevail and, and we don't have to cross that bridge. Thank you both so much uh, for taking uh, so many questions. Thanks to everyone for sending in questions. Uh, and if we didn't get to you this time, we will get to you next time. So do keep please uh, joining us. And over to JDCA's Chair Ron Klein to wrap up this call. And Ron, just unmute. There we go, sorry about that. Uh, thank you to uh, uh, our very special guest speakers today, Congressman, uh, Congressman Schneider, Congressman Jan Schakowsky, and uh, Ambassador Dan Shapiro. Tremendous insight. Uh, you're all three of you are in the trenches and are actively involved with the details, and we uh, very much depend on your insight so that we can, back in our home areas, communicate messages to our community and be advocates for sound, rational, common sense policy that can hopefully move in time to a two-state solution. Um, we'd like to also thank our board members for their introductions and participation. And we want to thank all of you for being part of our 16th call, Democrats Leading in Crisis series. Uh, we ask you to visit us at jewishdems.org. That's jewishdems.org today. Support us, uh, financially support us, and join a state chapter so you can be involved in your local and state elections as we determine the presidency, state, U.S. Senate races, congressional races, the races as well. We're organizing virtually in advance of the most important election of our lifetime and hope you can all join us by supporting JDCA. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Bye everybody. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you JDCA.